Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to to into your your homes in India and, and the far-reaching uh, areas of your your uh, responsibilities. And it's a pleasure to speak to you. So, what I'm going to talk to you today about is my my own experiences, the way I've seen things move within the industry, uh, some of the challenges and threats we're faced with, and uh, selecting a very small amount of information from a vast pot of, of tools, techniques, methodologies. So without further ado, I shall progress on. So my own background, as you, as you sort of really put into a nutshell there, was uh, in military background. I worked in the early days of my in, indoctrination into this world with the uh, new uh, in, in the Navy Yard in uh, Washington, D.C., working on sort of satellite imagery systems and and one of the the things that i really feel resonates with the, the subject we're talking about today is the fact that if you consider like a satellite passing over a, a terrain an environment it takes in the as you can see in the top right hand corner there, it takes in the perimeter well open source intelligence is very much the same kind of methodology it passes over everything that up to that point is not visible but as it passes over, it, it seeks and gathers a great deal of information. And that really is the topic of the approach towards how we, how we can capture, acquire, analyze, and produce what I call meaningful intelligence, something that comes out of nothing, you produce a product. So what we'll cover today, um, I'm gonna try and keep it as short as I can so I, I can let you, you guys catch up as well is, why do we need it? Why do we need um, this form of intelligence? What is it? Uh, where do those sources come from of, of this digital threat intelligence? How do we acquire them? How do we utilize them? How do we process them? And who is it of use to? Who, who would be interested in using this kind of technology? Um, and, th and that can be far reaching dependent on the, the, the overview of the, the subject matter. And of course, the important thing is the solution. The solutions are are many there are I, I did a count up this morning before i came into this office of how many tools free tools i've got in my kit bag and and of course the the caveat with free tools is some of them work and some of them don't but in total i have around about 450 resources that i can call on as i say some of them do work but some of them don't or some may work today but not work tomorrow so the caveat there is when using free tools you you need to be aware that the, the quality assurance is not always present. So consider and remember, uh, Professor, Professor Edmund Lockhart, wherever he, she steps, whatever he, she touches, whatever he, she leaves, it, it leaves a silent witness to, to that sort of person's presence. So we're talking here about hair fibers, blood, uh, maybe a tool mark. Uh, and this is in the physical domain that we see these kind of evidential materials um, artifacts being being uh, present. We also have the same thing with the logical environment. So the logical environment also leaves these tool marks, but in a very different format. And one of the, the key things I've found as an expert witness in court, um, and the really important thing here is the only human failure to find it, study and understand it can diminish its value. In other words, if we are going to a scene of crime where we have some form of and physical contamination or physical presence, and we don't handle that, that evidence correctly through a chain of process, then we will corrupt the evidence and therefore diminish its value. Well, the very same is true for digital information, only more so because digital, digital information is very fragile. It has a number of challenges. First of all, it, you can't see it, it's not tangible. You have, you have to discover it through various techniques but also it can be easily corrupted or lost or its value can be eroded. So therefore, when you do wish to present it, if in a court case, it is very difficult to sort of show something that's been corrupted. So one of the easiest things to do with any expert witness case is to actually throw doubt on the evidence being produced. So pr process is one of those important things. And as I always say in my academic teaching and, and the courses I deliver, there are three important things in this world of intelligence. First one is process. The second one is process. And the third one is process. They are the key factors to a successful outcome. So why do we need it? Why do we need this form of uh, 
intelligence, cyber threat intelligence, what, how do we sort of know it's of value? Okay, consider this. The state of online security, insecurity, which has been discussed this morning by the two previous speakers I've listened to, is, is in a dire situation. Research concluded in August this year, uh, looking at the sort of way we are exposed, produced some really interesting stats. So we need to recall that whilst the corporate government communities are more secure, but actually not perfect, those in the smaller business environment, the sector of the small medium enterprises are the most insecure, exposed and vulnerable targets. And the argument may be that well, we're only small, we're only a, a tiny company, we don't care. But the same is true for all the attacking fraternity. They don't care either. They are just interested in going where it used to be for banks going where the money is. It's going where the insecurity is because insecurity is going for the money. So against all sectors are significant and costly and on the rise and everyone and anyone is a target. Togs and follows no pattern. I mean, this, this is a, a test. I did a honeypot sitting on my at one machine in the last five, seven day period this covers. And I amassed around about uh, 500 odd attacks. As of today, those attack rates have risen to, I should just bear, I should consult real time. It's so within 10 days, we've had 720, 723 attack factors against one single box on my, my network. That's just one machine. So, and these are coming from various states. Uh, high on the agenda. I'm, I'm very vocal about Russia and Ukraine. So, high on the agenda is, has been Russia. China has been high. The Netherlands, Argentina, Europe, US, Canada, North Korea. In other words, everywhere. And, and the scattergram at the top shows you the, the amount of attacks I've suffered within the last, that was the five to seven day period. And we were looking at the 524 mark of events that occurred on a regular basis. And you can follow the timings. You can follow the timings as to where they're coming from as far as the terrain is concerned. So when people say, I'm not at risk, everybody is at risk. So how do we, uh, what do we need it? What can we use it for? How does it become of, of, of use? Well, first of all, we had a case in the UK of a 12 year old boy who died in, in his living room. Uh, and he died through some form of um, game, probably played on the internet, sort of challenging people to do stupid things. And this had a, a tragic outcome. But where the, the event here would be of value to open sources, looking at the computer that the boy was using at the time, seeing who he was talking to and extracting the, the important information from that machine. And one of the things we need to also bear in mind, if we go back to this slide here, only human failure can find it, study it and diminish it, is when we come down to a situation where we find a live asset, a computer that, that's working, we have to bear in mind it has a dynamic footprint within its memory, what we used to call RAM, and it has a number of things in there. So it could be that that, that, that technology is storing uh, encryption keys or a track that may give us some form of evidence as to what was going on. So that is very, very important. Um, misuse of assets, again, this kind of technology can tell us what's been going on, hopefully discover how it was um, introduced, say the, uh, the key of a USB user has been introduced to the, the machine, that key will leave a footprint within the, the register and we can go to that registry and find that footprint to identify that key. So we could start to sort of work through what those, those assets are indicating. Web searches, and the web of course is a, a massively powerful tool, but it also is a massively powerful resource to tell us things like um, what's been going on, where the, has the visitor gone to, what connections are active at the time. And going back to the, the massive resource, even when we talk about the cloud computing, where somebody has been attached to a cloud, going back to the, the, the dynamic memory of the machine, that memory may contain the footprint for that cloud. It may even contain the credential. So we, we should never diminish the value of the, the active state of the, the memory at the time of the, our acquisition. Say so an image, an image that's been sort of taken by a camera or cell phone will have associated 
exit data. That exit data will give you the time, date, location. Hopefully, if GPRS is turned on, it will give you the location exactly. And you can extract the image data. You can see where it was taken from, uh, and the kind of camera, the kind of lens, the aperture. So really, really important meta exit data associated with the the image um, use of cell phones the cell phone its registration its footprint how it was utilized um, what the core contacts are and there is a, a misconception about a cell phone when people feel they have done a reset on the phone before they get rid of that that phone and say donate it to charity or pass it on that reset doesn't actually clear all of the phone data so in cases like um, a murder case in the nottingham area some years ago uh, the cell phone was the actual evidence that produced the location for the assailant, the, the assassin. Uh, but one of the things we need to bear in mind when we have the cell phone to investigate, it's not always easy to get the data from the cell phone by logical means. So therefore, again, back to this one, only human failure can actually diminish the value. With the cell phone, it was necessary to actually destroy the phone to contact the actual points on the, the processor to try and physically extract the location. So that went against all of the rules of, of evidence handling. It had to be destroyed to re or attempt to recover the data. And unfortunately, the data was recovered successfully. An office document, office documents that contain a labyrinth of, of data, the person who produced it, the, the date, the time, uh, some uh, possibly associates of, of the, the value of that document. And that can be utilized in my experience for say, extracting meaningful intelligence from the document and utilizing that intelligence for purpose of um, circumventing the security of an individual, sort of socially engineering them. So you ring up somebody and say, well, I've just got this document from you, Mary, and this has been done in real time. Uh, I see you version, it's version 1.2 on this date. I see you've written that you get this like a, you get this communication rapport with the person that you're engineering because you know something about them. And this has been highly successful in my case for on many occasions. Metadata, data about data uh, that, that tells you an awful lot. You can have IP addresses, a whole host of information that can be secondary used to leverage some point of uh, interface. Hard drives that, that carry enormous amounts of data. One of the misconceptions with a hard drive is when, when you hear folks say, well, my hard drive is secured by Windows credentials. That's not a problem. You just take the hard drive out and connect it directly into another interface and you access that hard drive actually as it was in state on the machine. And therefore the only, only security against hard drive the fixed hard drive is to encrypt that hard drive or in my case i tend to sort of uh, use my my own data and keys like these my storage keys which are encrypted offline and safely tucked away and backed up onto other forms off my hard drive so none of my active data is ever kept on my molecular drive ram dynamic memory i've talked about an open source intelligence information intelligence that we can have acquire. So why do we need it three? So the potential of acquiring, exploiting any form of digital threat intelligence underpins the benefits of both proactive before the fact and reactive after the fact. In the proactive guise, we are armed with the potential to see the future, a little bit like the minority report, where we can understand where the next, say, insecurity may arrive from. So we're understanding our own digital footprint, and we are seeing the footprint that is open source to other people, other actors. So if we can see that footprint before they do, and we can identify the weaknesses before they do, we can actually see into the future as to what could arrive. And as we know, we've already talked about the level of attack actors that are active on everything. Therefore, it stands to common sense that utilizing this kind of threat intelligence to understand our own footprint it's really important. And if you're wondering who the lady is at the top there, it's Samantha Morton. That was the, the lady in the, in the bath in the minority report. In the reactive state, the digital threat intelligence may be exploited to support say, a past event, there's a team missing there I just noticed, or an incident, a digital investigation, or a digital forensics activity. And again, with expert witness work in court, 
are you tend to use open source intelligence to gather information about the same the site the location the entity the asset before actually present the evidence so it becomes a very very intrinsic part of the the value of the, the report and this is not a one trick pony it's not a one off thing that we just do we just tick a box it's the, the value is really limited by the imagination of the user. Where do we look? How do we exploit? How do we identify? Is it cloud? Is it a USB key? Is it the person? Is it the conversation? Every little bit of information that we're gathering here all comes down to one finite point of trying to aggregate its value. Um, let's look at some of the examples of uh, say upload so this is like going through image searches and looking for variations so we talked about uh, facial recognition this morning well there are many tools out there that we can utilize to do facial recognition or recognition against assets or buildings just to sort of utilize that int intelligence as to where we feel that could be and we'll talk about this in a little bit more depth in a, in a moment and if we look at that little box there sort of looking at the way that organizations do or don't do their security you know ad trackers uh, third-party cookies people who are actually monitoring your your activities on the internet as you visit their sites and if you look to the right hand side of the screen you'll see a number of um email addresses and these are all email addresses that were leaked out by utilizing open source intelligence against a target to actually bring out their 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 email address list, and there were hundreds of lists of email addresses here, and they were all sensitive. So I've actually taken the care to ensure that the, the names of the, the actor concerned have been removed. But this is where we now start to see the big picture of possibly the criminal side of open source intelligence, extract the data that can be utilized meaningfully for their own objective. So who is to use it? Well, it's of use to everybody from journalists, to law enforcement who are now really getting into open source in the UK, uh, professionals, uh, it depends on your job spec, or it may be even those people who wish to keep their own environment secure, their own domains, would look to open source intelligence to actually secure their own domain by understanding the weakness of their physical footprint. Solutions. So the first thing I always get a grip with, with folk professionals when teaching it it always comes down to how you use the tools how you apply the tool how you can utilize whatever piece of software you have and it's not about that it's about your intelligence it's about your using your brain seeing you know what you see what you hear what you understand what you analyze so just standing back not rushing in as i've seen done many times grabbing the tools applying the tools and then extracting the evidence. Think about what you're doing. It's not all about tools. And here again, we're looking at sort of, again, with, you may be approaching the scene of crime with metadata, hard drives, web scattering, technology implications, verbal uh, content. We may have had some form of report that gives us a direction towards where we should be going. Exit data, logs, email content, email he headers, DNS, etc. So we have to start to process this before we actually start to put our hands on any form of tool. So open source and is the power of the double edge methodology. So as I said, the, the double edge here is they can be used pro proactively in favor of security or reactively in favor of an attack or by an aggressor. So the top left hand corner is my take on what open source really is. We have the, the seven layer stack there from application down to the physical layer. Well, open source sits above that. It's a little bit like a pond skate. It sits on the surface and it's on that surface where it can actually start to manipulate and gather information, acquire data, which may give you the power as an attacker or a, a preserver to then start to find ways to go down through the application there, to the session there, to the transport there, to the network there. And I've done this in real time, and I've actually managed by open source intelligence to get down all the way down the stack into people's systems and to extract meaningful information. The box to the right of that is a live Twitter feed. Uh, again, live Twitter feeds, putting in keywords, say your own organization then, um, abc.com, and looking for what that can be, what, what people are saying about you. Uh, the scattergram at the bottom of it is the connectivity between the number of applications and assets and acquisitions that have been made. The little green spotty one is 
uh, way back machine which would take you back in time to see what was there before, which may have been deleted. The internet is a little bit like chocolate. A minute on the lips, a lifetime on the, a minute on the lips, a lifetime on the hips. This is the same. A minute on the internet, it could be a lifetime that's exposed. And the Equifax um, case there shows you how it is possible after you read about a, a, an investigation or a, a breach, how you can reverse engineer what actually occurred to make that exploitation possible. And the, the one at the top there was some years ago, I found a number of servers. I got in a bit of deep water for it, but I never declared where it was. But it was a third party, so it gives away again the third party exposure. And they were exposing uh, American service agency data on their servers on a, a third party domain who were working for them. So it's, um, it's a big thing. And here, where, I, where am I? Looking at a meeting, uh, it's not all about tools. So here's a, an, an interview I saw on the TV. It's the ex head of an I6. And it's just, you know, say you want to target where this person is. So here we're utilizing the image in the background that we can identify to identify a location. So the location here comes down to the Strata Tower. And from the Strata Tower, you can then go into deep, more meaningful uh, intelligence to gather location, uh, grid references, or even th what three words locations like the, the location to the left of the gentleman sitting there. That's what three words, which shows you the exact location. So there are a number of tools that you can utilize. And the other important thing is where you're trying to gather information about a physical asset in the uh, outside is the, the winter and sun conditions of the sun or the sun placement, how the shadow is being cast, how long is the shadow, which gives you an idea of the, the, the level of the sunshine, which way is it coming from, what's the time of day, and you can start to pinpoint. This is really, really useful information. So please bear in mind when you see an image, it's not just about the image here, the main point about the analysis, first of all, looking through the window and seeing what you can identify. Um, information exfiltration is now becoming the most rapid exposure. And so we're seeing the ransomware thing that was big now de being diminished to the value of uh, exploitation of exfiltration. So how else do we get that data? How we gather information? Um, well, here we have the, the torrent. The torrents are really, really useful for discovering uh, elements on the internet, uh, identifying weaknesses, exposures, what's been out there. So here we have some torrents producing info from the uh, Central Bank of Russia um, and other places such as, as, a, as, a, as a President of U Ukraine. So torrents that can gather information and give you insight into that location. So quickly going through the next few slides. Here, this is an example of the level of security that we see. Uh, bear in mind, I've just talked about exfiltration. Here we see the level of insecurity on a number of sites. So here we see a site that's leaking 69,729 data items being leaked. And if you wish to map how they're being leaked and when, and if you want to research back to the, the vector of attack, then you can see the timeline at the bottom. So you can start to investigate exactly why those timelines are so high. And in this particular site, they've got a lot of stuff going on, as you can see, third party cookies um, and other things as well, like their DNS settings are, are not well, as they should be. Another example, um, 40,283 data items leaked. And um, what is interesting here, if you look to the second one from the left, 170 breaches, 22 paste. Those 22 paste indicate that the data has been of value but has now been fully exploited and it's been pasted out to pastebin and other places on the internet for other folk to re-exploit. Same here, 194. This 194 to the left of breaches has 77 pastes, which suggests the data has been exploited fully and again released to the internet with 52,546 data items complete. And again, you can see the, the scattergram showing you exactly where the exposures were. So these go on so you can look at these post the presentation in the, in the interest of time. Uh, well, one place I looked at at Deloitte.com exceeds the results to pull back the limit. So it shows you they've got over 100,000 compromised assets in the ether of the internet or locations globally. So to learn more about that, look at breachaware.com. It's, it's a fantastic tool and it gives you the way of looking at not only your own in, 
footprint and securing your own environment, but also the environment of other people. Say if you're going to do a, a partnership with a third party supplier who we now know are pretty flaky in the main, we can utilize this kind of technology to see who we should be doing partnerships with. So the challenges to acquire and process artifacts and acquiring intelligence, there are a number of things that the challenges here, the isolation of the intelligence, so it's scattered around the place, and the aggregation. So we're looking to gather isolated items to aggravate in a form of meaningful intelligence to form a joined up picture that tells us something about what we're looking at. So we're looking at a, a, an exploitation of the, the acquired assets. So one of the challenges there, and I've found I've tried to do it without with the free tools, I said it, it, they're limited by the fact that there is no guarantee. One of two of my favourite, well, these are two of my favourite tools, and Bridge Aware is the third one, of course, is um, Paliscope and Yoast. So these are two really, really clever tools. Uh, so Yoast is an AI-driven search engine. Yoast is your own search engine that based on lexical content. So you can input to Yoast all of the data relating to that that environment that at that say hack or uh, case and yoast will process the data to actually connect the the points of data into other points of data which again produces that meaningful intelligence something that is really impossible to do by brain or by free sites uh, free tools and this is a case of yoast being utilized to sort of look for um, misinformation so we've got the case of the the Finnish Prime Minister, who dared to go and enjoy herself. Uh, how dare she and have a good time? Uh, and, and again, Yo's here looking at the data that was being collected. You can fit in with the, the data that you have. It could be anything from um, text, images, emails, and it will go away and process over a period of time and bring back you a pictorial representation of the case material you're looking at. So really, really powerful tool. And the other favourite one I have, I use this all the time, is Paliscope. I use it in academic sessions and, and in real life physical, physicality. It's a search engine capability that gives you the, the mechanics to gather your information, your intelligence, your investigative acquisitions as you go. So you can associate this all into one case related file, which is exportable. And that will then give you the ability when processed to see a map of association. So it starts to bring out the data into a contemporaneous recording, meaning at the time or as soon as possible after the time, so you don't forget it. And it also gives you the ability to relate and associate the various scattered elements into an aggregated format. Uh, with Paliscope and Yoast, there is far too much in there to sort of actually go through in this presentation. So what I would suggest, if you are interested in looking at something that, that's powerful, meaningful, and it produces in, in, invaluable reports, then I would gather that it would be worth looking towards the uh, URL. So with that, hopefully I've saved you some time. Uh, just remember one thing, imagination is the only limitation, and the courses I do go out through Merrick and the, uh, and the UAE. So uh, with that, thank you.